music team. Thank you for leading us in, in worship and song this morning. It is good to be together in the house of the Lord to sing his praises. Would you grab your Bibles, please, and, and turn with me to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15. Mark, chapter 15. Have you ever heard uh, somebody say, or perhaps you are guilty of uttering these words, um, it's just not fair? You ever said that before? Not you. I mean, you certainly wouldn't say that. You've heard other people say it. It's just not fair, right? Children might be the most um, obvious culprits, right? They want something they can't have, like an extra cookie or staying up late or something like that. And And they utter with great lamentation and sorrow, and they say, woe is me, for life is unfair, right? But children aren't the only ones who say things like this, right? They're not the only ones who think this way. I think we all sometimes feel like life isn't fair, right? Sometimes it's the small things in life. You're at the grocery store, and you come out, and you realize that somebody's dinged your bumper. Woe is me, life is unfair. Why, why? Why? This just isn't fair. Sometimes it's um, not small things like that, but it is larger and more serious things, like a, a devastating medical diagnosis. We say things like, why is this happening to me? Why me? I don't deserve this. This, this just isn't fair. Why do we say things like that? I think we say these things, whether we recognize it or not, whether we verbally mention this or it's just kind of built into our subconscious, we say things like this because we've determined in our minds what we rightly deserve. We have a certain view of ourselves and and what we deserve and what we ought to have, and we think when bad things happen to us, when uncomfortable or, or maybe just unhappy things happen to us, we think we deserve better. I don't, I don't deserve cancer. I don't deserve financial ruin. I don't deserve struggling in my marriage. I, I don't deserve these things. I don't deserve pain. I don't deserve hardship. I don't deserve toil or strain. I don't deserve any of these things. I deserve better. Why am I the one who has to deal with this? Why me and not somebody else? This isn't fair. I deserve better. Is that true? Do we, do we really deserve better than what we've got? It's how we feel, but is it true? Is life really unfair? Our passage this morning in Mark chapter 15 will, will show us something that is truly unfair. That at a definitional level, it can't get any more unfair than this. But rather than being moved to hopelessness and despair, we will be encouraged to consider the fact that, yes, life is unfair. But there's actually good reason to rejoice in that fact. Today, we're going to consider, as you can see the title of our our message this morning, we're going to consider the gospel, the good news of unfairness. So let's read the first 15 verses of Mark, chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. This is what Holy Scripture says to us today. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you 
the king of the Jews. For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you please bow with me for a moment of prayer? God, many of us are here today with heavy hearts. We are weighed down by the worries of the world. We're weighed down by the things that we see around us, by our personal, financial, familial situations. Lord, our lives are not perfect. They're not running as we had planned them. We look at our lives and we often feel like life is unfair. And Lord, I pray that today, as we walk through your word, that you would comfort us with the gospel of grace. Comfort us with your word. Comfort us with your promises, with your truth. May we May we say with, with the many voices of history and the many voices of Scripture that say, blessed be the name of the Lord. We ask for your help now and for the children downstairs. Encourage them in their time together. May they hear of the gospel and come to re- repent and believe in Jesus. We thank you now for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. You don't have to be a lawyer, you don't have to be an expert in law to read these first 15 verses of Mark chapter 15 to recognize that what is happening in this passage is unjust, it's unrighteous. If you've been with us in our study of the gospel of Mark over the past couple of weeks, you will um, remember that we saw all sorts of unfair things, all sorts of unjust things happening to Jesus. He was betrayed, that's not fair. He was arrested in secret, that's unjust. And he was tried on blatantly false charges and condemned, that is unfair and unjust. And now he stands before Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea, on trial again. But why is he here? Why is he standing trial again? If the Sanhedrin, hours earlier, had already pronounced his condemnation, why is he before Pilate? It's because the the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leaders, the ruling council of the people, they have a problem. And they have a problem of thinking they have lots of power, which they do in the Jewish realm, but they don't have one particular point of power which they need. They don't have the power of capital punishment. The Roman authorities did not grant, did not give the Jewish people power to execute people legally. Now, mobs would rise up and crowds would rise up and people would be killed unjustly, not according to the law. The Romans, though, were the only ones who could legally put somebody to death. And that's why Jesus is before Pilate. He's before Pilate because, yes, the Sanhedrin have decided he's worthy of death, but they need Pilate to sign off on the death warrant as well. We see them come before Pilate with Jesus, presenting Jesus, and they're trying to pressure Pilate to side with them, to agree with what they are saying, that Jesus is guilty. So what's the first thing that they do? They, they hurl all sorts of accusations at Jesus. We're told in verse 3, and the chief priest accused him of many things, not just one thing, but all sorts of things, trying to get Pilate to recognize and agree that Jesus is worthy of death. But when that doesn't work, they change tactics and they go to the mob, the crowd that is gathered outside. 
and they start to stir up. They start to incite the crowd. They basically threaten Pilate with violence. Pilate, you side with us or you're going to have a problem on your hands. And as we watch the trial of Jesus unfold, we can't help but notice that everything that's going on is unfair. None of this is fair. And two things stand out to us, or they ought to stand out to us, that that sort of highlight, that bring to the front the unfairness of what's going on. The first thing is this, that Jesus is innocent. Mark just puts right at the front this truth that Jesus is innocent. He's not guilty. He is not worthy of death. He is not worthy of being on trial. Pilate asks Jesus in verse 2, are you the king of the Jews? It's a bit of an odd question, isn't it? Like there's no pretext for that. Where did this come from? There was no lead up, no build up. I mean, the passage earlier, we saw that they were accusing Jesus of being the Messiah, son of God. Jesus claimed to be the son of man. Where did this king of the Jews idea come from? Well, it came from the Sanhedrin. Remember, the Sanhedrin, they need, they need Pilate to side with them. They need Pilate to agree that Jesus needs to die. But they've got a problem because they know that Pilate doesn't care about religious squabbles. Pilate does not care about the Jewish Messiah. He doesn't care about Jesus and the Sanhedrin butting heads over what is Messiahship, what does it mean to be the Son of God, what does it mean to follow the law of God. He just doesn't care. He's not a part of that religious system, and so he doesn't care about any of it. So what the Sanhedrin need to do is they need to convince Pilate that Jesus is a threat to Rome. So they, they alter their accusation. They modify it a little bit to something that's a little bit more politically charged. Messiah is religious, but when they tell Pilate that Jesus is claiming to be king of the Jews, that's got a political aspect to it. Last week we saw that that Jesus affirmed his identity. Yes, I'm the Christ, I'm the King, I am the Messiah. Um, And in the minds of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish people, kingship was bound up with the concept of Messiah. There was the religious side, Messiahship, and the political side, kingship, being king of the Jews. So they don't change their accusation per se, They don't swap it out for another one. They just lean heavily into the political side of Messiahship. And so they put forward that Jesus is claiming to be king of the Jews because a king presents a threat to Rome. And so Pilate asks Jesus, is it true? Are you king of the Jews? To which Jesus replies in verse two, you have said so. It's a bit of an odd, bit of an odd answer, isn't it? It's not... It's a little vague, it's imprecise, it's unclear. Um, It's not a straight up yes. I think the 1984 NIV, if some of you have the old NIV, um, it it actually says yes in there. That's not quite true. Um, It's as the ESV now states it, it just says, you have said so. So you say. That's incredibly unclear. It's not a yes and it's not a no. What kind of an answer is this? Pilate's not so sure either, right? We may not be sure exactly what Jesus means, but neither does Pilate. If, if Pilate thought that Jesus was saying no, if it was a no, then he would have heard all of the charges of the Sanhedrin, he would have heard Jesus' testimony, and he would have let Jesus go. The Sanhedrin are full of false accusations. We read that last week, right? Many, many false accusations. And as we read later in the passage, we know that, that Pilate understands that they're just jealous of Jesus, So if Jesus said no, he would have just let him go. But he doesn't let him go. But he also doesn't condemn him, right? He doesn't say that Jesus is guilty of treason. So he doesn't think that Jesus says yes either. Pilate's kind of left in this middle ground of what what does that even mean? So what does Jesus mean when he says, you have said so? Why doesn't Jesus just say yes? How do we answer that question? Is Jesus the king of the Jews? Yes, he is. Of course he is. That's what many points in the Old Testament are actually pointing us forward to, to understand that, yes, Jesus is the son of David, David's greater son who has come to sit on David's throne. He is the king. He is not just a king of the Jews. 
He is the king that all of the Old Testament prophets were pointing forward to. This is the guy you've been waiting for, Israel. This is your king. So why doesn't he just give a clear, unambiguous answer? Why doesn't he just say yes if that's true? He doesn't give a clear answer because Pilate doesn't understand the depths of what it actually means to be king of the Jews. And neither do the Sanhedrin. Is Jesus king of the Jews? Yes. He's the Messiah. He's the rightful ruler, the rightful king of Israel. But he's more than that, isn't he? He's not just king of the Jews. He is that, but he's so much more. He's not just king over the the land in the Middle East, known as Israel in the first century. He's not just king over one particular people group. He's not just king of the Jews. He is king over all. He's the king who sits above every throne. He's the king who has the highest authority over every people group. And his kingdom is greater than all other kingdoms on earth. We've been, we were singing about that this morning, weren't we? He is the king who reigns. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He is the Lord God Almighty who reigns on high. There is no one greater, there is no one mightier, there is no one with greater authority or power than King Jesus. He's not just king of the Jews, he's king over everything. And what Pilate fails to see, what Pilate fails to understand is that the man who stands in front of him, who stands beaten by the Sanhedrin, The man who stands before him known as Jesus of Nazareth is the one who actually stands as king over top of what Pilate ought to do, what he's obligated to do in this moment, if he understood who this Jesus was, what he ought to do is bow down in reverent awe and worship of this one true king. Mark doesn't record everything that took place. You know, Mark is the um, snapshot guy. Out of all the gospel writers, he's the one that just gives us short snippets of things. Mark doesn't give us everything about the trial of Jesus. When we read some of the other Gospels, we, we read about how Pilate actually heard from his wife. Do you remember that? His wife said, have nothing to do with that man, for I've been tormented in a dream about him. We read nothing of Pilate sending Jesus off to Herod. And what does Herod say after hearing Jesus? I find no fault in this man. I find no guilt in him. Mark doesn't give us any of that, but he gives us enough. He gives us enough to see that Jesus is innocent. Even without Herod, even without his wife giving a pronouncement, Pilate here understands that Jesus is here, not because he's guilty of religious problems. He's not here for political reasons either, because he's committed treason against the state of Rome. He is innocent. He's innocent religiously, and he's innocent judicially. He's not guilty, and he stands as ruler above, not just Judaism, not just above Israel. He stands as ruler and judge above even Rome, because he stands above every nation. This is the the first thing that stands out to us, right? Jesus is innocent. Mark just kind of lays it all out there. But the second thing that we see, the second thing that stands out for us is that Barabbas is guilty. Jesus is innocent, we see that, but then in verses six through eight, we see that that Jesus, or that Barabbas is guilty. Barabbas is a man who actually poses a threat to Rome. Barabbas is a man who is guilty and deserves to die. We only have a brief description of him, right? Mark doesn't give us a whole lot. We've only got one verse, actually, verse seven, right? But it's enough for us to see that he is clearly guilty. 
And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. How is Barabbas described? He's called a rebel. He's engaged in guerrilla warfare against Rome. He hates Rome, he hates the occupation, and he wants Rome to be destroyed so that Israel can receive its own national identity again. He's called an insurrectionist. Another phrase for rebellion, right? He's an insurrectionist and a murderer. I don't know if, uh, if Rome had a most wanted list. You know, the FBI has top ten most wanted list or whatever. I don't know if Rome ever had one of those, but if they did, Barabbas was the guy who would be near the top, right? He's fighting against their country, against their nation. He's fighting against Rome, and he is a murderer, He's broken the law of Rome by becoming a rebel and fighting against them, and he's also broken the law of God by engaging in murder, by committing murder. What do we see very clearly in just one short, small verse? That Barabbas is guilty and he deserves to die. Not just because Rome says so, but even in God's sight, he deserves to die. But then something incredibly unfair happens, right? Mark lays these two things out. Jesus is innocent. Barabbas is guilty. And then what we see is the most unfair thing that could ever happen. Barabbas is set free and Jesus is condemned to death. Can you think of anything more unfair? The innocent being condemned while the guilty going free? That is the very definition of injustice. We cry out against those kind of things if we see them taking place around us. Verse 6 tells us about Pilate's custom of releasing a prisoner. He doesn't do it out of the kindness of his heart. He does it to appease the people. He does it to placate them, to make sure that they, they don't riot. He wants to keep rioting to a minimum. Because Pilate, Pilate did all sorts of things to, um, to annoy the Jewish people. Are politicians annoying? Don't answer that. Believe it or not, politicians can get under the skin of their subjects. Pilate was very good at doing that. On one occasion, he brought idols into the city, which started a riot. One other time, he was unsatisfied with the aqueducts that, um, that were in existence, so he stole money out of the temple treasury to fund his building of aqueducts. The people were furious. They rose up and rioted against Pilate, against the Romans. Pilate was not a popular guy, and he had to be careful. Jerusalem, at this moment, remember, what's taking place? The Passover, the Passover feast. There are thousands, hundreds of thousands of Jewish pilgrims who are now in the city. Pilate's got to be really careful because it's not just the Jewish people who lived in Jerusalem. It's like lots. And if he's not careful, he could have a riot on his hand. And the crowd that is gathered that we read of in verse 8 they present a threat of rioting. They've, they've gathered to seek the release of a prisoner. They know what Pilate usually does, and they want to come ask him for somebody to be released. And, and Pilate thinks he's got a way out of it, right? Pilate thinks he's found a way out of his judicial problem. He doesn't really know what Jesus is saying. He didn't get a straight answer. So if he condemns him, he might get in trouble. And if he exonerates him, he also might get in trouble with both Caesar, with Rome, with the Sanhedrin, with the people. He's, he's got just a really sticky situation on his hands. And now he thinks, okay, I've got a way of getting out of this. Pilate knows that the Sanhedrin are jealous, right? It says in verse 10, for he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. And so he thinks that because he knows that these guys don't really have a case, maybe I can turn the crowd against them. These guys are just bloodthirsty animals. Maybe I can get the mob that stands outside to ask for Jesus to be released. But things don't go as planned, right? Pilate thinks, we shouldn't blame him because this actually does kind of make sense. Pilate thinks that they're going to want the miracle worker, right? The guy who makes lame people walk and blind men see. Who wouldn't want that guy to come out of prison, right? Who, who wouldn't want the guy who could feed 5,000 people with a few small loaves and some fish? But he overestimates his own ability to sway the crowd, and he underestimates the ability of the Sanhedrin to infect the mob. 
In verse 11 we read, But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him released for them Barabbas instead. And now Pilate is out of options, right? He doesn't know what to do. He's fine with setting Barabbas free. Notice how his argument is not based on the wickedness of Barabbas. Whoa, 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 you want this guy? Have you seen this guy? This guy's terrible. You don't want him. Look at this guy. Jesus, he's much nicer. You should go with Jesus. That's not his argument. He doesn't really care which one of them gets released, right? But he doesn't know what to do with Jesus. He doesn't know what to do with Jesus if the crowd doesn't ask for him. So he asks the crowd in verse 12, then what shall I do with the man you call king of the Jews? They've messed up his plan entirely. They're not helping him out by asking for Jesus. So maybe by asking them, Pilate can just kind of push the blame on them. I don't know what to do with him. What do you guys want me to do with him? What should we do with Jesus? And now we see what the Sanhedrin were really doing in that crowd. It wasn't just persuading the people to ask for Barabbas. In fact, in all likelihood, the crowd that is gathered there is there to ask for Barabbas anyways. This is not the same crowd that sang as Jesus entered Jerusalem at the beginning of the week. It's not the same group. The way Mark structures this by saying, here's the custom in verse 6, here's Barabbas, and here's a crowd that wants to ask for somebody to be released. He's structuring that in such a way that he's showing us that actually this crowd is here because of the custom to ask for Barabbas. They're likely there to ask for him anyways. It's a bunch of his friends that want Barabbas released. What the Sanhedrin were really doing was not just convincing them to release Barabbas, but to call for Jesus to be crucified. Look in verse 13, and they cried out again, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. And so Pilate, he agrees to their demands, right? He doesn't care about justice. He doesn't care about what, what's right. He doesn't care about Jesus. He doesn't care about Barabbas. He doesn't care about anything other than making sure that there's not a riot that starts outside his house at this moment. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. What just happened? Mark says Jesus is innocent. He then outlines very clearly that Barabbas is guilty. How did we get here at the end of verse 15? What happened? The most unfair thing in the history of the world. That's what happened. Jesus, the perfect, innocent, holy son of God. What happens to him? He is condemned to death. And Barabbas, the guilty, murdering rebel. What happens to him? He's set free. And that isn't fair. It's not And can you imagine, can you imagine what it would have been like for Barabbas at that moment? You're you're sitting in your cell, you're contemplating your own death, you know that Rome will want to make an example out of you, not just because you're a murderer, but because you're an insurrectionist against the occupation of Rome, they will want to not just kill you, they won't just want you out of the picture, they will want to make an example out of you you know that you will be put on a cross. That's what they did to make examples out of people. It wasn't just excruciating physically. It wasn't just a long, painful, slow death. It was a warning as people hung on crosses outside of the city, as people walked by, they saw the crucifixion, the execution of criminals, and they were warned, don't end up there. Don't do what this guy did and end up there. Barabbas sitting in his cell, he he knows what's coming next. And so you're sitting in your cell, and, and you hear the guard fumbling with the keys outside the door, right? You know what's coming. And when the, the door finally opens, you, you expect to be taken away, hauled out publicly before the crowd, where you will be beaten, where you will be flogged, that term scourged, is, is an intense beating and flogging. It's not just you know, being hit with a stick. The whips that the Romans used were, were leather whips with bone and metal and stones that were 
intertwined into this leather strip. And as you were beaten with this whip, they wouldn't just like daintily take it off. They would pull on it to the point where your, your flesh and your muscles and your cartilage, they were torn from your back. Scourging was so, so deadly, actually deadly, that many, many people didn't actually make it to the crucifixion part. They died because of the beating, because of the scourging. And Barabbas, he's expecting that as that door opens, that's his fate. That's what awaits him in just a few moments. But then to Barabbas' surprise, the guard releases his chains. He removes the chains from his hands and his feet. And as the guard walks Barabbas out of the prison, out of the palace, and onto the street, he says, you're free to go. What does Barabbas receive in that moment? Does Barabbas receive justice? Does Barabbas receive what is right? What is fair? Does he get what he deserves? No, of course not. Barabbas doesn't receive justice because justice would have him hanging on a cross. Barabbas doesn't receive justice. Barabbas receives mercy. Barabbas deserves to die. And then something incredibly unfair happens. Barabbas is set free and Jesus is condemned to die. Barabbas, the guilty criminal, he is exonerated. He is released. He is set free. And Jesus, the innocent king, is condemned in his place. Jesus dies while Barabbas walks free. That's unfair. And here is where I want you to consider the unfairness of your life. We, we often complain. We're often thinking that, that we deserve only, only good things, nice things, happy things in this life. That's what we think we deserve. And we think life is unfair because, yeah, we know we're not perfect, right? We, we're all quick to say, yeah, I'm no saint. I'm not perfect. But really deep down in our heart of hearts, we really do see ourselves as pretty good people. As innocent. It's not all that bad. And we don't think we deserve anything uncomfortable. We don't, we don't deserve anything that hurts or anything that might be what we would call wickedness or evil. We see ourselves as innocent. But how does the Bible describe us? Not, not what do you think of yourself. What does God think of you? The Bible describes us not as innocent but as Guilty. Sinners. The Bible says we are not innocent. We're not like Jesus. We view ourselves as Jesus in this story. Woe is me for all this terrible stuff is happening to me. We need to understand that we're Barabbas in this story. This is us. We are guilty. We stand guilty, not before religious leaders or political rulers. We stand guilty before the thrice holy God. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. The one who is holy is the one that we have transgressed against, that we have sinned against. And this holy God has rendered his verdict. We are all guilty. We are all deserving of death. What does Paul say in his letter to the Romans? For the wages of sin is death. That's what we deserve. Life isn't fair. And we need to thank God that life isn't fair. Have you ever thought about that? Life isn't fair. Life is hard. Life is difficult. But we don't deserve anything good anyways. We don't deserve fairness from God. We don't want God to execute justice. As we, we heard from our, our brother Vodi Bauckham last week in Sunday school, we don't want God to give us justice because if God gives us justice, we all die. That's what we rightly deserve. We don't want justice. We don't want fairness. We want mercy. We would all be dead right now if it were not for the mercy of God. Have you thought about that? That God did not owe you your life this morning. You did not deserve to get out of bed this morning. You did not deserve to make it to church here this morning. You don't deserve your family. You don't deserve your finances. You don't deserve your health. You deserve nothing. 
from God, but condemnation and death. That's what you rightly deserve. We don't want God to be fair. Be very careful when you're talking about fairness before a holy God. You don't want God to be fair. You want God to be merciful. And that's exactly how God acts towards us in Jesus Christ. He is merciful towards those who stand before him, not in their own righteousness, not in their own works, not in their own deeds, not in who they are. He gives mercy to those who stand before him in Christ. But why does he give mercy to those who don't deserve it? Why, why, would, he, why would he care to show mercy to me and to you? Though maybe, hopefully, most of us are nowhere near the category of Barabbas. But we all recognize what we deserve. Why does God show us mercy and grace? He shows us mercy because of the great exchange that took place on the cross. At the cross, Jesus took our sin upon himself. At the cross, Jesus took the wrath that was rightly reserved for me. And he took it upon himself. At the cross, Jesus died so that sinners, so that sinners, not people who are mostly good and a little bit bad, so that sinners might go free. And we are set free. God gives us mercy. He gives us grace. He gives us forgiveness when we repent and believe in his name. And then when we do that, when we put our faith in Christ, when we walk away from our sin and walk towards the righteousness of Jesus, another exchange takes place. This exchange where Jesus not only takes our sin upon himself, that's the first exchange. The second exchange is when he actually takes his righteousness and he puts it on us. The gospel isn't getting a clean slate. It's not about having our record wiped clean. That's only half the story. Jesus not only takes our sin upon himself, he gives us his perfect righteousness. So that now, to those who have faith in him, they are given what Jesus rightly deserves. We get what Jesus deserves. Have you thought about that? Have you given thanks to God? That because of what Jesus has done, you receive all the blessings and benefits that Jesus receives. And you receive it because he took on what we rightly deserve. He took our place. An exchange was made. The perfect king for rebellious sinners. Life isn't fair. And thank God that life isn't fair. And so as we look at the things in life that are hard, and difficult, and we're tempted to say, yeah, life, life isn't fair. Man, this is hard. I don't deserve this. What do we need to do? Take our eyes off of the things around us. We need to get the right perspective, reorient ourselves, and remind ourselves that, ah, God owes me nothing, and yet in Christ, he has given me everything. Thank God that in Christ, I receive mercy instead of justice. Have you received the mercy of God? Have you repented of your sins and put your faith in Jesus? Have you done that? Have you been set free from the penalty of sin? Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Would you please stand together? We're going to sing this hymn, And Can It Be? My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee.
Sunday school at one o'clock after the service. Young adults later this afternoon, four o'clock up at our house in Newmarket. If you want more details, come see myself or Candace. Um, ladies, you have a, a brunch. Breakfast, lunch, brunch. You're meeting on Saturday. Come for food on Saturday and there will be something going on. Please, uh, is there still a sign up at the back? Please make sure to sign up for that. Um, amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Would you please bow your heads with me as we pray to this great God and Savior. Father in heaven, these words that we have just sung, we ask that you would help, help this hymn to resonate in our hearts as we go from here today. May we remember this great gospel truth that yes, we are great sinners, but Jesus is a greater Savior. Thank you for the love that you have given to us in Jesus, and we pray that today you would embolden us, that you would give us courage and faith to walk in this dark world and to tell this lost and dying world of their need of the Savior Jesus. Lord, we are weak and we are frail, and so we ask for your grace. We ask for more mercy today, and it's in the name of our Savior that we pray. Amen. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.